Okay, are we everyone's ready? We are ready to go. We're ready to go. Okay, great. So good afternoon, everybody. The time is 1.04 p.m. Today is Wednesday, July 12th, 2023. I would like to call to order this meeting of the Finance Administration and Procurement Subcommittee for the East Bay Community Energy Board of Directors. And I'd like to begin by asking if uh, Adrian would please take the role. Great, thank you. Uh, Member Anderson. Present. Member Dola. Here. Thank you. We need to turn up the... There is, a, I'm not sure we can barely hear you. Oh, maybe it's the, oh. Member Bedoa, could you just uh, identify yourself again so we can check the volume? Yes, sorry about that. Okay. Yes, I'm here you? again, sorry. Okay, great. And, can you hear um, me now? Yes. yes, we can hear you now. Member Gonzalez. Vice Chair Cox. Chair Bowers. Here. Thank you. Now is the time for public comment. A member of the public wishes to comment for an item not on the agenda for today's meeting. We'll have two minutes to do so. Is that we have a we have a rule against two minutes? Two or three minutes. Either. Two minutes is the protocol I'll be using. So two minutes to give public comment, and I'll ask Adrian to let me know if there are any members of the public with their hands raised in the virtual room. There are no members. There are no hands raised. Okay. This time. And there are no people presenting at East Bay Community Energy's office locations. So public comment for non-agenda items is complete. We'll move to item three, which is approval of the minutes from November 4th, 2022. Uh, is there any public comment for the minutes of November 4th, 2022? Seeing and hearing none, public comment is closed. We'll turn, are there any members who wish to edit or otherwise correct the minutes? The only thing I... You weren't on the board at the time. Right. Um, so uh, I will just ask staff, staff, do you in your um, estimation believe the minutes are a true and accurate reflection of what happened on November 4th, 2022? Yes, you can rely on that if you wish to vote on the minutes. Is there any further questions on the minutes? Seeing and hearing none, is there a motion on the minutes? So moved. I have a motion by Anderson. Second by Member Bedoya. Thank you, I have a motion by Anderson and a second by Bedoya to approve the minutes. Please call the roll. Member Anderson. Aye. Member Bedoya. Yes. Member Gonzalez. Member Vice Chair Cox. Chair Bowers. Aye. Motion, the minutes are approved. Thank you. Uh, motion carries. Minutes are approved. We'll move to item four, the 2023 FAP agenda items. This is an informational item only. Turn it over to staff. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> Jason Barlett, Senior Finance Manager here at EVCE. Uh, this is, item is just to kind of orientate uh, the, the meeting schedule and to go over some uh, upcoming items that are anticipated. Uh, next slide, please, Adrian. Uh, so the current 2023 schedule is that uh, today, July 12th, uh, there is one uh, originally scheduled for December 6th, but that uh, my understanding is that is currently being rescheduled to accommodate some requests. And then there will be one on November 8th. Uh, all meetings are scheduled at 1 p.m. about every other month on either the first or second Wednesday. Uh, Next slide, please. Great. So uh, items in this meeting are going to be uh, the current calendar year items and schedule, which we are currently going over. Uh, then there will be a review of the prepay number three approval discussion, as well as the 2023 RFO overview or request for offers through the power resources programs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, additional meetings and expected items from finance are, are listed here. In September, uh, we will be giving a, a progress on the audit. The audit has officially started for the most re closing of the most recent fiscal year. Uh, so in September's meeting, we'll have an, a progress report on that. Uh, we are also uh, pursuing a treasury management uh, selection process that will be through a, an RFP, uh, which will be underway and so we will present uh, status on that. Uh, and then uh, another item that, that we're uh, processing is arrearage management, collections, and write-offs. And so a kind of full, more full discussion will be presented there. Uh, in November, uh, we will review the, uh, the first quarter financial statements from the current fiscal year. Uh, 
that will be through September 30th. Uh, we usually require about 45 days to close, but we'll get this one done uh, by that November meeting. Uh, we'll also be going over the surplus waterfall from the most recent fiscal year, the one that has just closed, and updating the committee on um, on how those funds have been applied and the status of, of those balances. And then we will also review a mid-year budget outlook going in, kind of setting up and presenting for uh, what will probably be a board item in January. Um, so those are the items that we have uh, currently in the, in the pipeline and expected to be discussed. Uh, there may be additional items added to this, um, but this is uh, current. The, the current large items we're expected to bring. So thank you very much. That is the end of this item's presentation. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, thank you. Before we take questions, we'll turn to public comment. A member of the public wishes to comment on agenda item three, sorry, four. We'll have two minutes to do so. Do we receive any written comments in advance of this meeting? We have not received written comments. Okay, there are no members present, no hands raised. Public comment on item four is closed. We'll turn to questions and discussion. I'll start with member Anderson. Do you have any questions for staff on any of the items that were presented? Uh, I do not. Do you have any further comment you'd like to make at this time? Member Bedoya, do you have any questions or comments on this item for staff? No. Okay, I just have a couple. Not at this time, thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. I just have a couple of quick items. One is um, the rescheduling of September 6th. Who has not replied? Uh, that? Member Gonzalez and uh, Member Cox. So the two not present members are the two who have not given their schedules yet. Okay, we are looking to change it to the 5th, the 7th, or the 8th of that week, or later in the day on the 6th as an aberration for timing. So uh, thank you to the members present who have replied, and um, I will be sending an email to those committee members today asking them to comply with that. Um, other than that, uh, I don't think there's anything else that was presented that's on the calendar that needs to be discussed at this time. Um, we'll end item four and move to item five. Item five is uh, overview of the 2023 long-term resource RFO. This is also an information item. I'll hand it back over to staff. Good afternoon, Scott Harding, Director of Originations. Very happy to have the opportunity to present before you today um, on the 2023 long-term resource RFO. Um, just a quick overview and a few slides that we have here for you to provide uh, some basic information on where we're at, what we're looking to do, and uh, some of the next steps. So if you could go to next slides, please, Adrian. So we'll look at uh, the overview of our solicitation and the process and essentially what we're looking to do during that solicitation. Uh, we'll look a little bit on the participation that we had, which is I'm happy to, pre uh, to uh, present that we have a, a very good pool of participants in this RFO for this year. Uh, we'll look also a little bit at the evaluation process and what goes into that and some of the inputs and the outputs to that and, uh, and the resulting next steps as a result of that. And then some of the challenges in the marketplace as well as the next steps and uh, some of the just kind of a quick overview of some of our current portfolio contracts that we have in place right now and what we're looking um, you know, to add to that portfolio. Uh, go ahead, next, next slide, please. And Chairperson uh, 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 Bart uh, Bowders. Bart, Bowders, yeah, Bowders, Bowders, thank you. Uh, oh, please just let me know or interrupt me if there's any questions. Happy to answer any questions as we go through these slides here. Lots of detail, but uh, looking to just kind of uh, provide you a basic overview here. Um, so some of the goals that we had as a part of this particular RFP, very similar to the goals that we had in the previous, previous RFO back in 2022. If you may recall, we had a similar RFO for long-term resources. Um, and that was basically to ensure that we comply with our midterm reliability resource requirements as, as, as well as our IRP uh, near-term resource requirements. But really what we we're looking to, looking to do here is secure a portfolio of contracts. Um, and uh, the EBC customers benefit from that secure portfolio when we're able to achieve affordable 
and the clean uh, sources of energy that is coming through this type of RFO. Um, but we also want to meet the, the current CPUC compliance obligations, and uh, we also have obligations when it comes to uh, PCC1, which stands for Portfolio C Content Category 1, uh, Renewable Energy Credits, or RECs. Uh, we have some obligations when it comes to carbon-free and reducing our carbon emissions that uh, we want to make sure that we meet, and that's a part of this RFO as well. Um, but really, you know, a part of uh, all those compliance activities is also he hedging, and we want to make sure we can get low-cost energy hedges. So these, uh, this RFO, RFO specifically targeted those types of projects that allowed us to do that, and the uh, types of resources that are uh, such that allow us to maintain a low-cost uh, type of energy hedge. And then in this particular R4, like, like, we, like we did last year, we're partnering, partnering with San Jose Clean Energy. Um, and that's really just to minimize expenses, allows us to share uh, attorney fees. And it's, uh, it's a lot more efficient when you join with uh, another group and you can achieve economies of scale on larger projects as you would um, uh, share with another group. Um, some of the characteristics of the projects, we're looking at projects to be within or outside of California, but we're really uh, targeting things that are deliver deliverable to the ISO, and they must provide RA. RA is resource adequacy, and that is essentially um, a resource that we want to put in place that allows us to meet kind of like a single hour worst case scenario situation. Um, and so we're requiring that for all these projects. And then um, as far as construction status is concerned, we want to make sure that in this particular process that energy and related projects uh, come from either new resources or even uh, resources that are added, uh, adding capacity or repowered uh, to existing types of resources. So we're uh, pretty much left at kind of a broad open type of uh, approach when it comes to uh, the types of projects that we wanted to look at, uh, but as long as they're uh, solar wind or storage or some other renewable uh, type of eligible renewable resource. And then the capacity we're looking for anywhere from five megawatts uh, up to essentially, you know, no, no limit on capacity. So, you know, yeah. to put a number on that, we've seen <laughs> quite a few projects that are in the 500 megawatt range, 400 megawatt range, 300. Um, and so those are all things that we're looking at in our products that we are seeking for this RFO. Um, and uh, um, it's exciting to see the different projects and different project size. I'll, I'll tell you that much because there's lots of really exciting projects that, uh, that are large and some that are small too and very efficient. Um, we want these projects to be delivered anywhere between the dates of uh, 2024 and 2030. And as you know, we have uh, targets for zero emission by 2030. Uh, um, or carbon-free, rather, uh, by 2030. So we want to make sure we meet those goals. We also have uh, uh, RPS compliance targets that ramp up, essentially, to 2030 that we want to ensure that we meet those goals with some of these uh, projects that come out of this RFO. Uh, contract duration uh, is we're looking at 10 to 20 years. And then the different technologies that we are looking at, large hydro renewables, uh, anything when it comes to any type of solar, uh, any type of wind, uh, and um, essentially anything that is eligible renewable. There are some that we um, don't necessarily target, but essentially if it's renewable, we'll take a look at it in this RFO pro uh, process. And then, um, you know, energy storage, as you probably know, is a key uh, attribute to most renewable integration uh, abilities. And so, we're looking at storage, both uh, short and long duration, which is essentially uh, can the storage provide output for one hour or four hours or eight hours or even 16 hours. So we're looking at all those different kinds of duration in this RFO process of storage and uh, really kind of any technology of storage. There's quite a few out of them. The most common is lithium ion. Uh, and so that's kind of what most people offer in these RFOs. But we would really look at any kind of storage uh, technology there. And then uh, some of the actions as a result of this RFO uh, is to, you know, issue a broad and, 
and, and you know, make sure that we're open and competitive in our solicitation process. And we ensure that uh, uh, the, the respondents through this RFO process are providing uh, projects that are at a competitive rate and uh, you know, allow us to have a low risk application of those projects to our uh, uh, load service uh, customers. And then uh, as we go through the evaluation, those different combinations of projects, we wanna achieve our desired uh, targets uh, through 2030 um, and beyond, really, because those will go for 10 to 10 to, to 20 years. Uh, and then we typically prioritize uh, things like project risk, location, workforce development, um, economics, and, and some other uh, characteristics there. But um, uh, there is some limited ability to do that just because it is a bit of a seller's market. Um, and so we're cognizant of that, and we're trying to uh, ensure that any um, leverage that we do have in the marketplace is placed in our favor in this RFO process and throughout negotiations. Uh, and we've essentially, to this point, we've encouraged RFO participants to be creative and provide any uh, variation they can think of that might be something that we want to study and take a look at and evaluate from uh, economics and other qualitative characteristic perspective. If you go to the next slide, please. We'll talk about the uh, different products that we sought out. Um, and again, you know, these, these are similar to the 2022 RFO, but there's some slight differences here, but we had four products that we targeted uh, as available RPS product, which is essentially kind of a newer or added capacity to an existing kind of standalone uh, PCC one, kind of the, the portfolio content category one, the top level tier category of eligible renewable uh, generating resources. And product number two is, um, is as available RPS plus energy storage. So there's developers out there that have the ability to locate a solar project, for example, with an energy storage project. And it allows that project to be more efficient and interact with our load requirements and the market dynamics more efficiently and more effectively by adding that storage. So we're looking for that in product two. Uh, product three is a kind of like a firm or shaped type of RPS product where uh, someone might have the ability to, to produce solar power uh, and maybe they have a backup um, uh, storage facility they have on site that they want to schedule a block of energy to us. And that has value to us as well, kind of similar to number two, but slightly different in terms of how it would be uh, sold to us. And uh, product number four is kind of like a standalone uh, energy storage, kind of like a tolling agreement or an RA only offer. Um, the tolling agreement, if you know, just to, just to kind of uh, define that, is essentially where they own and and operate it, but we have the ability to say how much we want from the facility. And it's, it's essentially ours to uh, schedule the energy from those different types of uh, the resources. But standalone energy resources are very useful just because we already have uh, you know, a, a large number of capacity on our portfolio that is solar only or wind. And so the standalone aspect can help us better um, uh, um, economically dispatch those existing resources uh, you know, integrated with the market dynamics uh, for uh, East Bay here. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. And again, if, is there, if there's any questions, I can't uh, see everybody exactly that clearly, but just please uh, let me know or, or flag me down or raise your hand. I'll, I'll, take them, I'll take them at the end of your presentation. Don't worry. Okay. Sounds good. Um, and uh, so we had a good participation. I'm really happy to report that we improved our 2022 RFO participation, we, we had uh, 195 project variations, 72 unique project sites. And, you know, I've done a lot of RFOs and, and the number 72 is a very large number. It's a very good number for us to be able to take back to our evaluation team and uh, take a look at and study. Uh, so it was a very good uh, response that we got from this particular uh, 2023 RFO. Uh, all four products were, were responded to. Uh, and then we had different uh, technology offers and variations related to solar, wind, and battery storage in this particular offering. So those are 
good technologies that are well priced and and with uh, battery storage allow us to uh, very well integrate those into our portfolio. And then um, there were uh, six different states that were represented by all of our offers, uh, California, Arizona, Idaho, New Mexico, Nevada, Wyoming. Most of them, though, did come from California. Um, two projects only were in our territory uh, within the EBCE territory. So uh, we are looking those, at those very closely as the location and locality of the projects is a part of our evaluation criteria. So if you could go to the next slide, please, Adrian. Um, during our evaluation process, and by the way, our evaluation team is, is an awesome uh, team uh, led by uh, Chris Eshelman. He does an awesome job modeling all these projects. There's uh, lots of different combinations and different ways to uh, evaluate these economically, and he just does an excellent job, and, and he's just a, an expert uh, uh, person to do that. Um, so we look at the execution of the counterparty, uh, off of competitiveness and the project development status, in addition to uh, the, the NPVs, if you will, the net present value, the value of the project itself. Um, counterparty execution is, is really looking at who the counterparty is, what is their ability to uh, deliver the project on time and as they are advertising it as and as they're offering it. Uh, the competitiveness of the offer is really about uh, the pricing and some of the, the the terms in the agreement that allow us to reduce our uh, level of risk. And then the project development status, some some projects are already uh, very far along. They've already uh, applied for transmission interconnection. They've already uh, achieved uh, permits and they're ready to start construction as long as they have uh, a, a PPA in place. Other projects still need to do that kind of thing. So the project development status gives us an indication of how long it's going to take, or what are the risks in terms of getting the project there on time? Um, and then we had two reviewers uh, assigned each project between us, uh, EBCE, and San Jose. And then we reviewed all those submitted information and provided score in all categories and the net present value. Um, and then what we ended up doing was we looked at things from a hundred point uh, a total point perspective. Uh, between the qualitative aspects and the quantitative aspects in our evaluation. And then we essentially looked at what their term sheet markups looked like and reviewed that. And then uh, we looked at the MPV scores. And so a little bit on this slide here is our evaluation criteria. So the, the MPV, which is the, the quantitative aspect of our evaluation, is 55% uh, of our evaluation scoring. And and then uh, we essentially look at forward curves. We had uh, uh, five different forward curves that um, are uh, based on different market potential outcomes over the next 10 to 20 years that allow us to look at the different variations of risk on a, uh, a different project. And then we look at uh, the P50, uh, the 5% and the 95% uh, uh, perspectives on those different var var variations and then the modeling uh, um, provides a result based on those inputs that we that we look at and those uh, statistical evaluation that we uh, process. Uh, and then we normalize the number into a cost per megawatt basis. And, um, and then we look at other factors like uh, the counterparty execution risk, and we give that 20 points worth. And then the development status risk, we give that another 20 points. Uh, if it's a local business, we give them a 4% or four point um, uh, weight to the total score. And then if they're a small business enterprise, we give that one point in our evaluation criteria. So all that is essentially put together and they, uh, they get a score of between zero to 100. Um, and then we look at those total qualitative scores and quantitative. Uh, qualitative quantitative scores and then choose those to move forward in our process. Um, you know, this is a very similar process uh, as a 2022 process. So I, I think nothing really from that perspective has changed. Really the only things that have changed since 2022 are the products offered and requested, the MPVs, 
and uh, the time horizons of when those products will be delivered. A lot of this other stuff is really, a lot of it is the same. Uh, go to the next slide, please, to the, 2020, uh, to the next slide. Um, just a, a quick slide here on, on some of the challenges in the marketplace. I think everybody knows that the supply chain challenges are still ongoing, um, and that presents um, a uh, pressures on the markets, pressures on deliveries when it comes to materials to actually build these, these uh, projects and, and facilities. And there's some uncertainty related to future tariffs and core components. Um, and then really the result is that the suppliers of core components, they, they price uh, the pricing, they, they use index structure. Some developers are not always willing to do that and they're not always willing to price the risk uh, or take on that price risk. And so the index allows us to um, observe kind of these extreme markups in price to cover that risk. So in general though, prices for generation storage resources have increased a little bit, about 30 to 40% since 2020. Uh, go to the next slide, please. So talking a little bit about next steps, um, we want to complete the negotiation projects under consideration. We anticipate those uh, presentations to the board beginning of September and continuing through the winter. Uh, we have already kind of started that process with some of the uh, some of the counterparties that were in the process to shortlist as we speak right now. Uh, and so that is already underway uh, now as we speak. Um, and then we're gonna assess the projects as they hit key milestones and mature further. Um, and then of course, uh, updating and, and filing the CPUC on status of uh, the different time horizon reliability requirements, and that's all due August 1st, 2023. So we have, uh, we're working on that right now as we speak, uh, and that's due here coming in the next couple of weeks. And then the CPUC's 2024 IRP cycle provides formal opportunity for portfolio review and analysis of an open position, cost and risk. And so there's some further engagement that will be required with board and the community as part of this IRP process. And I think the next slide is looking at, if you go to the next slide, Adrian, it's looking at our current portfolio. So this is a pretty good mix. So we're looking at this and we're uh, uh, essentially looking at uh, what are the requirements per the IRP and per the uh, midterm reliability requirement uh, uh, mandates from the CPUC. And, uh, we're selecting those projects based on the current position and our future needs, and uh, as well as the um, total evaluation scoring, and we're selecting those projects to move forward. So um, this is just a summary of everything that we have in place, and there's uh, lots of RPS projects. There's RPS plus storage, as you can see, and we have a really good healthy uh, standing position right now, but we're looking to add to that as our load grows and as time progresses and our uh, re uh, compliance requirements grow as well. So really happy to present this to you folks and uh, happy to be here with you and happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a thorough presentation. Now I'll call for public comment. Members of the public who wish to comment on this item will have two minutes to do so. Adrian, did we receive any written comments in advance of this meeting to this item? There were no written comments received ahead of time. Okay, thank you. There are no members present here and no hands raised online. Public comment is now closed. And I'll turn to uh, committee members for discussion. I'll start. Uh, I don't see member Bedoya anymore. He will be easy. Been going in and out. Okay, I'm going to start with member Anderson. Do you have any questions or comments? Thank you so much. Um, it, this is really an interesting presentation. Um, and you know, there's a lot of moving parts here. I understand that. And one of the things I was curious about in terms of thinking ahead, you know, 10 to 20 years over the lifetime of these potential relationships is grid expansion <laughs> and how that may or may not be a limiting factor to some of our future procurement. Yeah, I, I'm help, happy to speak to that, but Scott, um, if you want to um, chime in as well, uh, feel free. Uh, I, I think if you look at the history of our RFOs, um, we've uh, obviously had a predominant focus on California-based projects, 
Um, although we've always solicited and, and, and looked at offers from outside the state of California as well. And, and so if you look at that portfolio, there are sort of a select number of out of state uh, projects. And I think as we look to continue to build a portfolio, we'll continue to look at opportunities outside the state of California to expand on uh, just because that's a lot of concentration within the state of California. And we think about um, different types of resources, for example, resources in New Mexico, where we have a wind project as a very different wind profile than our Alameda County wind project. So it's a, it's a good opportunity to diversify your portfolio resources. I think when you look at California also, the a lot of commentary that's being talked about right now is the constraints of you know, the And so I think, you know, it's uh, an all of the above sort of approach to trying to meet our load, which means resources in locally in our county, resources in Northern California, resources throughout California, resources outside of California, a diversification of technology to the extent that's possible. But obviously as we focus more and more on clean energy and renewables specifically, you're naturally getting quite a bit of concentration there. Um, and of course, we're trying to layer in as much behind the meter uh, sort of virtual power plants as possible as well. Those being very hard to scale given the size of our load, but being a critical tool that we're, we're really all, all CCAs and, and all load serving entities are trying to focus on, but it is, you know, there's a limitation on that today at least. Um, and so it's not a very satisfying answer, but there are significant challenges from a good perspective. And you know, the dates that Scott highlighted there, looking at kind of 24 to 2030, if you look at our RFOs throughout history, we do these about every couple of years. So we did one in 2018, 2020, 2022, and then we actually accelerated this one because we just see a need to procure more resources. And there were some specific challenges out of the 2022 RFO, um, similar to what Scott touched on in terms of supply chain, et cetera. Um, but what I wanted to touch on there is just we're looking further out. It used to be more of a four to five year duration on our first RFO. And this one, it's more of a seven year duration going out to 2030. And even then, there's quite a bit of uncertainty in terms of what does the interconnection process look like? And that's getting sort of extended long. Um, so these are very much so challenges that we're trying to face um, and think about you know, how do we engage more with ISO, CPC. Uh, in improving the interconnection process so we can get resources done both sooner but with greater certainty. That was a great answer. I do have a follow-up. Go ahead, um, please. Um, so I, I do appreciate that you called out uh, that there are two projects um, in the EBC mm -hmm. service territory because I do remember that came up in our larger board discussion of wanting to potentially have um, more projects in the pipeline that are closer closer to where we're consuming the energy. Um, so I just wanted to note, note that and also um, give a shout out to the project of the Altamont Pass uh, that several of us went and I can't remember if you were on that tour or not, but um, had an amazing tour of those wind turbines. Um, it was just, it was very impressive. And um, I just wanted to express some appreciation for that. And I'll actually just note there's there is an, an additional project oh, actually in hey. the territory, the Intersect Aramis project where we're a resource advocacy off taker. So actually that one's not listed here because it's specifically RA, but um, it's worth mentioning that for sure. Thank you. Member Bedoya, do you have any questions or comments for item uh, five? This time, no. I just want to say everyone, uh, thanks for bearing with my connection issues. I'm trying to figure out this router thing. <laughs> no worries, thank you. Um, I, I, you asked, you asked uh, my, one of my questions, but I, I have a couple others um, on the evaluation process that you guys used. Um, I just had a couple of questions about, and this is just, I think, due to my, my newness to the board. Um, so how was the scoring matrix determined? Is that, does that a completely internal process or does the board review that before you put out the RFP? How do you guys decide that? Scott, if you want me to speak to the history there, I'm happy to, but if you want to speak, um, this year's process feel free as well. Yeah, I, I, and and I'm glad I'm glad you have the history because yeah I've only been here for a couple months, gentlemen uh, and ladies and gentlemen. But uh, so I don't have all the history on that. But I do know that this evaluation criteria was used from the previous version, and whether or not that was passed by the board, maybe maybe Howard, you might know that. Yeah, it, it is a consistent rubric we've used since the very first RFO, and I mentioned the handful that we've done, and we did review that with the board. Uh, which include both subcommittee and an ad hoc procurement committee 
talk through the very specifics of that rubric. It was not something that was formally approved as an action item. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess then my only, my only comment was I noticed that we only give like one point to local, to local and there was four point or one point to small business and four points to local maybe was what it was. Uh, five five percent. I I'm not here long enough to I think have a strong opinion about that, but I I would just observe that it that in terms that it seems like a small amount between those two, um, and it might just be worthwhile since we've done three of these that before we go out to do this again, um, I would just recommend that it come back to the ad hoc committee just to talk about because I do believe you know. Um, projects that are local, uh, awarding them local, awarding them um, with an emphasis on small business partnerships or impacts, things like just those types of programs, I think are really critical for economy and also for the perception of the agency um, from the public side. I, not everybody's gonna dig into these weeds, but we have members of the public and we have a community advisory council who uh, are attentive to these issues. And so I, I'm, I'm good with the evaluation and scoring process. I just think before we do this again, uh, my recommendation would be that staff come back both to provide that history because you have so many new board members, but also to revisit it. Um, other boards I'm on, we've revisited our own scoring criteria for regular types of things that we do. And we've made small adjustments that reflect kind of the direction that other agencies or the state or the feds are going. So I just think it's a good practice to do that if we've done this a few times. So that's my only uh, additional comment, but I'm very grateful for uh, the presentation and. Uh, thank you for answering the questions we have. Are there any final questions from committee members? Okay, Adrian, do you have a comment? You have a hand raised. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I think so. Yeah, public comment is closed. I'm sorry. So members of the public who are attending, you're going to learn that with me once I close public comment, I close it. I don't reopen public comment. Um, sorry for that. So I just, as a practice, don't do that. Um, so we will uh, we will move to agenda item uh, six. And agenda item six is, sorry, I'm scrolled into the PowerPoint on this one. Agenda item six is our energy prepay number three approval informational item. Um, and I'll turn it back over to staff. You can pull that presentation off. I'll be presenting on it. Uh, as a reminder, I'm the chief operating officer for EBCE. A um, couple notes on this item. It's a very lengthy um, document. Um, uh, so two, no, two things to note, I think what was originally posted um, in the agenda packet had a couple just sort of technical glitches when it was PDF, and so a couple of the slides were blanked, mm -hmm. unfortunately, but we did refresh that. Uh, Adrian has reposted that, um, and so this, this is the full uh, copy. Um, and then the second item is that we did uh, provide an update on this particular item yesterday with a full set of documents. Mm -hmm. It's a very large set of documents, 500 plus pages, I believe. Uh, one, I'll apologize that we didn't provide that earlier. We've been pretty active in working with our council to update that, but we did want to get it out as soon as this, it was available. Um, and I'll just note that we are anticipating bringing this to the full board in okay. July. So there is time between now and then to review. So nonetheless, wanted to get it out yesterday, okay. even though it was a little late relative to the agendizing process. So apologies there. We'll try not to do that. Um, so jumping to this presentation, Adrian, if you can go to the next slide. Um, this is a complex transaction, though we have presented this a couple times in the past, but the executive committee as a general overview and then to the full board for approval of our uh, various council and advisors for this transaction. This is the third energy prepaid transaction that we're looking to execute on um, and largely mirrors the structure and the approach and all the various parties that utilized in prior transactions. So in that sense, it is replicating something um, that has been effective for us. Um, but let me just provide a bit of an overview because I know this is uh, somewhat new to some of the board members at least. Um, uh, an energy prepay is a long-term non-recourse transaction that tax exempt those of the entities utilize. Um, and we work with a taxable financial counterparty, in this case, Morgan Stanley, and would utilize our ability to issue municipal bonds in order to reduce our energy costs. Um, Typical energy prepays, and there are gas prepays out there, and there are energy prepays that are structured very, very similarly. It's typically 30 year transactions, and the notional value is anywhere between $500 million and a billion dollars. There's nothing that says that has to be the case, but generally that has maximized the amount of discount that is available. 
Um, and um, if you're gonna go through the effort of pulling together these complex documents, you know, having a sizable transaction makes it a, a sort of more, more efficient effort. So that's why those, those parameters are generally the case. Uh, we utilize uh, this transaction really to lower our energy costs at the end of the day. Uh, we assign in our existing power purchase agreements. So contracts that we would otherwise sign or have existing, we put it through this uh, transaction and we are able to utilize our taxes at debt levels uh, in order to get a, a discount. There are a few different flavors related to energy prepays. This is probably a more complex one, but there are other forms where a tax exempt entity would simply work with a seller and say, I'm going to repay all this energy with you directly. We're going to raise bonds. Typically, oftentimes that would be on balance sheet and they would pay down, they would, they would prepay that because typically a project finance project would have taxable debt. And so a tax exempt entity could do that. That's, a, that's one flavor of it. This is a different flavor where we work with a taxable financial counterparty and create sort of a structured transaction and then assign our PPAs into it. And we're still able to basically utilize the discount, which is obtained via the taxable versus tax exempt spreads. So it's largely doing the same thing, but through a somewhat more complex process. Before you go on, I'm actually asking a clarifying question. Can you explain the non-recourse components of this? Because when we had this as an information piece in the last or one or two board packets ago, I was really trying to wrap my head around the third party component and how there's just the non-recourse element. I'm not sure I fully understand it yet. And I would love to- that, Absolutely. That is a really critical piece of this <laughs> and why we go to the effort of, of sort of some of the complication of the structures because it's off balance sheet and it's non-recourse. Um, and uh, we issue it through a conduit, which is that part is not, I think, particularly unique to the structure. Uh, a lot of debt in California is issued through conduits, whether it's a city or a JPA. Uh, so we, we do that. Um, it is non-recourse because when we take the funds, we prepay that energy, in this case with Morgan Stanley. And actually the transaction is, um, is rated based off of Morgan Stanley's credit rating. And so they have a, a repayment. Obligation. Them as a financial institution's credit right. rating. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that it takes their credit worthiness because we take those funds and we give it to Morgan Stanley as part of the prepay. And so the bond investors are actually taking their credit, um, the credit their credit risk, mm -hmm. and it is fully off balance sheet for us. Interesting. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Just touching on these other bullets, um, uh, municipalities throughout the U.S., including California, have executed on this transaction. Um, there have been dozens of these done through prior decades. Um, it's it was initiated through a natural gas structure and it continues to be very popular amongst natural gas providers throughout, throughout the country. Um, the application towards renewable energy is a newer one that's been done just over the last couple of years, last few years, uh, but it, it takes the exact same approach and structure as, as it has been done uh, by, by sort of natural gas providers um, since, since the 90s. Um, it is codified in US tax law um, the various parties that we use are very large national um, law firms, uh, well-established. Uh, we specifically use ORIC as our tax counsel that reviews this and ensures that uh, it's compliant with the tax law. Would you like to ask a question before we move on? I do, Wilson. I don't know if you have an answer, so maybe I should hold on to it. Go ahead and ask it. Go ahead. Well, so, so my question is, so you're the, the reason to do this is because you're um, working with the difference between non-tax and tax, right? So utilizing that delta to come into a favorable agreement. Can you talk a little bit more? Absolutely. <laughs> so um, because we're a tax exempt entity, we can raise bonds uh, in the market at lower costs than the taxable rate. We are providing these funds to a Morgan Stanley in this case, though other transactions, it can be a different, different financial counterparty and they obviously have a different um, uh, cost of debt. And so when you look at the difference between the taxable and tax exempt rates, um, historically there is a difference, but obviously there's volatility. And there is a graph in here that sort of shows that spread. As that spread increases, that ultimately gets translated to a discount that gets applied to our energy costs. If that spread is smaller, the discount the benefit of this transaction goes down, of course. And so that the, the very value that is created through the structure is because there is a differential between the taxable and tax exempt spreads. And the greater that is, the greater that benefit. Um, is, um, but that's 
really what you're doing is you're looking at the difference between those uh, costs of debt um, and you're taking that value. And because uh, Morgan State is ultimately receiving those funds as the energy prepay supplier, they're able to give us a discount for the, uh, to the sort of prevailing energy costs that we have already previously agreed to on a few days. So they're getting the benefit of the rates that we, we would get as the tax exempted entity. Well, I would say we're all parties both, benefit. Both of us. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to figure out why the federal government would like do this to undermine taxes, but maybe I'm just not where I should be on my mind. Like, why would they create that? And why would they put that in the tax code? Is there some reason to incentivize that or allow that? I can't speak to that level of history. Yeah. I, I would be happy to. I'm just trying to figure out, like, I'm probably off chart, off chart here, but like, just trying to figure out like why why this would exist like other like what the reason for this was yeah Maybe it's just I, a lobbying expedition who knows it, and and again I can't speak to that level of history mm -hmm. um, you know actually we'd be happy to inquire with our tax council which probably could have a little bit more but at the end of the day um, I I think this the benefit that was created because we are a tax exempt entity we're prepaying our energy so you know, while it is maybe a complex way to achieve that benefit. Um, the reason why I brought up the more simplistic approach is you could take it on balance sheet and simply prepay energy from one specific project, with one specific seller, you, you know, and, and, and then achieve that, that, that same benefit. Because at the end of the day, these projects are generally built with taxable debt. They're all project financed. And so, um, you know, you know uh, solar project A goes out and raises debt and it's going to be taxable. Um, even though it may be a tax exempt entity that's ultimately providing that power, mm -hmm. so this structure really, uh, you know, is 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 straightforward in concept in the sense that we are taking utilizing our tax exempt status in order to actually prepay that very energy, and so arguably, why why should we not have the benefit of our tax exempt status or that? The, okay. Why is that allowed through? Well, I just remember that the background being natural gas did this first. I'm just trying to think right, like, right. you know, it's a little different thinking of us as tax exempt, which is. Well, for, but just to be clear, for natural, for natural gas, um, while we certainly prefer renewable energy, the natural gas providers are all tax exempt municipalities. Oh, OK. So, so we miss okay. utilities okay, throughout utility the country. Are, or you know, for example, SMUD in California, uh -huh. they utilize this both for gas and for energy. Oh. Um, and so, you know, they're they're. OK. Taxes that yeah, of course, go ahead. Great. So my question is about risk. What is the risk to East Bay Community Energy, and how long does that risk exist? Like, what's the time horizon for that risk on these types of structures? Yeah. Uh, in general, this is a very low risk transaction because it's, it is off balance sheet and it's non recourse. And so, if there is a collapse in the structure for some reason because something was done incorrectly, the structure does collapse. Morgan Stanley is obligated to repay those funds. Okay. And the risk to us is we are no longer receiving that discount. Okay. But we are then put back to our original Rich. energy okay. prices. So in that sense, the risk is low. Huh? The risk is an opportunity cost largely because if we, if we were able to achieve a discount via some other means, right. then we would miss out on that because for something was done incorrectly for the structure. Mm -hmm. I would say the, the various council advisors we've utilized have worked Quite a bit on this very structure um, throughout the history of, of this mm -hmm. tool, so to yeah. speak. Yeah. And so I think that risk is fairly low, but I certainly won't claim that it's zero. You know, <laughs> right. If IRS or anything wants to recodify things, there is always that risk that a transaction could no longer be valid in the future, I suppose. Again, I think that yeah. is still because there are a number of these transactions that are out there existing. Um, and this has been heavily scrutinized by, by, by tax council itself. Okay, and just one last. Yeah, one. go ahead. What's the time horizon for the? The overall transaction is a thirty-year transaction. A thirty-year transaction. Yeah, exactly. And uh, the other risk I would just say again, I would put this in the category of opportunity mm -hmm. costs. Is uh, the transactions get repriced every depending on the term of the bond? Uh -huh. So it's a thirty-year energy prepaid transaction, but you look at the spreads on maybe five, seven, or ten-year bonds, uh -huh. and you reprice it for those depending on what the tenors are. So our uh -huh. first transaction is a ten-year bond. In our second transaction was a seven bond. So mm -hmm. after that point in time, you go out back out to market to the bond market and reprice it. And there is always um, there is always a risk that when you go back out to market, those spreads are a lot less. Right. There's even a risk those spreads can be inverted, which is very unusual, but in the history of, of spreads sure. that yeah. has occurred. Right. Uh, that is not a risk to us that okay. we pay more, just to be clear. Okay. There is a minimum discount that um, is obligated okay. to us, okay. and then we have a right to step oh. away if we oh. 
Oh, well, that's good to know. Now, I think the, the practical reality is if the spreads are lower than they are today, we'd likely still say, and they're below the minimum, but they're still you know, a discount to us. We'd say, let's go ahead and forward with it because any discount's better than no discount. But certainly if the spreads were oddly inverted. So it's just our option. And it's Morgan Stanley who bears the risk on that one. That is correct. Okay. Great. Fascinating. Learning a lot. Yeah, so am I. This is <laughs> when I tried to read this packet a couple of months or two ago when it was a lot of this was in there. I was really like I had like diagrams trying to follow how it all went. that is fair. It's, so. it's taken me quite yeah, a bit yeah. of repetition to, to, to get in on it. If you can go on the next slide, Adrian. I feel like we probably covered a lot of this. Yeah, we, we, we probably have. So I'll try to move through it relatively sure. quickly. But just as a reminder, we've done two other prepaid transactions, one in 2021, one in 2022. Uh, we've issued all of these through the California Community Choice Financing Authority, which is a JPA that he's, he's a member of. There are a number of conduits for hire in the state of California to issue bonds. We created this with a handful of other CCAs because it was a cost reduction measure to pay up for utilizing those conduits. Um, and there's um, enough scale of uh, prepaid transactions amongst the CCAs that kind of uh, The annual savings from the first two transactions total roughly $7 million per year at the outset. I say at the outset because there is that repricing mechanism when the initial term of the bonds end. And so that, that number is subject to change in the future. Um, it could go up, it could go down. Um, uh, they're off balance sheet, we've mentioned that. Um, the discount is based off the taxable and tax exempt spreads. We talked about that. Um, and we are now looking at third transaction, of course. That's why we're discussing this. And we're planning to bring that forward to the July 19th regular report for Move forward, Adrian. Um, apologies for the bordering. A little bit of a oh, wow. copy paste. Issue, so. <laughs> <laughs> Ignore that duplication. Okay. That's just one graph. Um, the, the, the value of this transaction is based off the taxable and tax exempt spreads. Um, the, uh, the blue line here reflects taxable level and the MMD reflects a tax exempt level. These are sort of proxies in the market. Uh, the actual discount that we receive, of course, is gonna be based off of Morgan Stanley's cost to borrow and uh, EBCE's um, uh, cost to borrow. And so you know, these are just used as proxies because at any point in time, if you go out to market and try to raise bonds, that number will change depending on how hard you are. But this is a reflection of the market. You can see it is highly volatile. It is difficult to predict. Um, but the greater that spread, the greater the value is that is there. Um, the, the approach we've always taken is get the transaction ready, get the docs ready, get approvals, and then sit and wait and see where the market conditions are at the time. It is always possible that we get approval in July um, and the spreads are not there. Um, and we say, you know what, we're just gonna sit around. And there, again, there's no ability to really predict what the spreads will be. And so you sort of sit and you monitor. Um, that's part of the, the benefit of working with a experienced bond underwriter such as Morgan Stanley is they obviously have the in the market. They're out there talking to bond investors, um, assessing, you know, whether they think it makes sense to actually officially go out and fix bonds or not. Um, but in all our, you know, at least our two prior transactions, they have amounted to significant savings. Um, and so for that reason, we get prepared for a third transaction. We hope that to be in the short term, but it could always extend. Um, the last bullet point there, noteworthy, um, there are a total of six outstanding energy prepaid deals across four CCAs that have been executed. Uh, we have, of course, done one. Silicon Valley Clean Energy has done two, one of them with us, one of them independently. Uh, Pioneer Energy, uh, MCE, um, and CPA have all. So actually, we're, we're five, sorry. Uh, NCPA has, has done two transactions as well. Um, and then 3CE right now is, is looking to go out to market at a similar time to us. So uh, there's quite a bit of interest from CCAs. Um, certainly, the, the list would be long if we were talking about all the various municipalities in California and throughout the country that have done this for energy and for natural gas, but even in the CCA system. Okay. You have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. What's, so we've done two, two of these, one with um, Silicon Valley and, and EBC's done one on its own, right? So two, two, two of those six involve EBC. Correct. Um, 
So, and this would be a, a third or two and a half or whatever you want to <laughs> qualify. It. Um, so, so is it is this just so attractive that we want to be looking at this every year going forward? Is that is that what I'm sensing? I, I think it is very attractive uh -huh. as a way to take existing PPAs and apply a discount to that. Mm -hmm. And we obviously look at every opportunity there is to bring down energy costs. So in that sense, very attractive. And it's based off the risk profile of executing these transactions, which are non recourse and off balance sheet, we feel it makes sense to continue to you know, utilize this, this tool. As to how often it makes sense to go out, I think we're, we're eager to get out to market because that means a greater discount. So the sooner we can do it, the better. With that said, as we do with our own hedging portfolio, it's best to cost average over time. You, know, you don't know where spreads will be in two years or three years or four years. So we don't wanna throw everything we have, all our energy to this transaction day one. That may be attractive today, but you don't know if in three years, a slightly better mousetrap is invented. There's a better way to achieve that discount. Um, you know, with, with something like the IRA, we are evaluating putting projects on our balance sheet and owning them. And um, the IRA allows us as a tax exempt entity to utilize some of the incentives that have historically been tax-based incentives for project developers, which is one of the reasons why most renewable projects are done as third-party PPAs is because the primary incentive tool is an ITC or PTC, which is an investment tax credit or production tax credit. So obviously it's a tax exempt entity, tax exempt entity. We can't monetize those incentives. It's just the nature of how those incentives were structured um, federally. And so the IRA has created a structure where a tax exempt entity can actually take that incentive. And so we are evaluating the opportunity for projects on balance sheet only. Obviously, that opens up a whole other category of risks of going into operating assets that we want to further evaluate and, of course, bring to the board and discuss. But you know, all that is to say, this is one tool. It's a valuable tool. We continue to revisit it, obviously, for a transaction. But you don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak. Right. You want to cost average over time. You want to evaluate other things that may come about, such as IRA structures. Um, and so I anticipate we will probably continue to bring things forward every one, two years. To the board like this if, if there isn't a better tool that comes along um but it's not going to be all at once and i will say not every energy transaction we sign is just easily assignable into these structures you have to go out and get approvals and consents to assignments that does take a lot of work and there's invoicing settlement nuances that occur with this so yeah. you know you have to find the right projects that kind right. of fit in you're not going to go put in a six-month project ppa into it it's just a lot of labor. Right. We do that for short periods. We, we generally put in our long term, or at least multi year. Right. Well, and, as, and as the chair pointed out, I think at our, um, uh, when we talked about as a, as a board, as a full board, um, you know, and be approved, there's costs associated with these transactions, right? There's attorney's fees, there's, there's sort of five different sets of costs that we looked at as an entire board. So it's not free to do the transaction. That's right. right. Those are low risk in the sense that right. they're contingent. Right, right, right. But yes, but there's that's one of the costs. reasons you want to have these at a scalable size. If they're really small. It doesn't make sense to pay all these such. Um, if you go to the next slide, jump to the next few. I think we've touched on a lot of items now, but this is just a quick summary of the first and the second transactions that we've done. The first one with jointly with Silicon Valley uh, in 2021 at about one and a half billion dollars in total proceeds that was split between us. Um, and ultimately, I equated to a sort of a 59 megawatt on the clock PPA for us. In future, PPAs that we may assign to it doesn't necessarily amount to 59 megawatts because it may be a solar PPA and that has a different capacity factor. So that just gives you a, a general sense of the size. Uh, on the second transaction, that was a standalone ECE transaction that was just shy of a billion dollars and that was equivalent of a 75 megawatt round the clock transaction. And sorry, I, I did misspeak. The, the, the second transaction is a six year bond, not a seven year bond. So, so they're different, different bond tenors, and that again just simply looks at the spread of the various curves at the point in time. Uh, next slide, Adrian. We've seen this list before in prior board approval, so I won't really rattle through all the different parties. But um, these are the various council advisors that we utilize for these transactions. Uh, every single party is the same, with the exception of the commodity swap counterparty, which has changed uh, between the Texas and Royal Bank of Canada. Um, uh, but every other party is, is, is identical. 
Um, next slide, Adrian. This one's worth spending a little bit of time on. Uh, this is the reason why we updated the packet with a 500 plus page <laughs> um, uh, set of documents. These are the various documents that EBC actually signs and that we will seek approval on uh, in the July board meeting. Um, so I'll, I'll just touch on these relatively quickly. There's the power supply contract, and uh, that is actually a contract signed between EBC and CCCFA, which is the bond issuing conduit. So that's a third year contract, basically where we are buying energy from CFA, that is um, back to back with a different contract on another slide uh, where CCCFA signs a contract with Morgan Stanley, mm -hmm. who is the energy prepay supplier. And so because it's a condo, we just have these agreements that largely mirror each other. Uh, there's a letter agreement regarding PPA assignments that's between EBC and Morgan Stanley that sort of details how we assign in our various PPAs. And then there's the actual form of limited assignment and that's an agreement between us, Morgan Stanley, and our various PPA counterparties. Uh, there's a project administration agreement that's between EBC and CCCFA because CCCFA is a largely um, a conduit vehicle that doesn't really have a balance sheet um, issue the bonds through it. Um, you know that just sort of sets out that where the EBC is the one paying the fees and things like that, not CCCFA. Um, there's a PPA payments custodial agreement um, that is between EBC, Morgan Stanley, and Bank of New York. The Bank of New York um, operates our, uh, as our custodian. Uh, they house all the cash flows for this transaction, and they're responsible to ensuring that uh, debt service is paid at the time um, and all the flows uh, work, work out clean. The last one is a cost share MOU that's between uh, EBC, CC, CFA, and Morgan Stanley. Uh, and that is on, on specifically on the rating agency and the green bond designation fees. It's just a cost sharing arrangement that says this is the, the rating agency fee is the one fee that's not a contingent fee, technically, but we don't go out and have them rated until we feel very confident right. that the transaction is ready and we want to mark it. But ultimately, once you ask them to rate it, you are on the hook for those, for those fees. So this um, MOU stipulates that Morgan Stanley and PBC would share those costs. Uh, equally, it's not just on at, at EBC's risk. Next slide, Adrian. This is a set of documents that CCCFA signs. Um, the prepaid agreement really is, is probably the most critical one to identify, but that's, again, that's a mirrored agreement that we have between EBC and CCCFA. So in this case, CCCFA and Stanley. Um, uh, there's the repricing agreement, and that really stipulates the terms for when that initial bond tenor expires, how they go out to market, and that establishes that sort of minimum discount that we have and what our sort of step away rights are. Uh, there's the trust indenture, and that's really serving uh, the rights of the bondholders themselves. So our bond council largely puts together that based, based off of various agreements that we're putting in place between C -C CFA and what it's in. Um, there's a commodity swap agreement uh, that includes, in this case, the Texas, in prior cases, it's RBC. Uh, there's a parent level guarantee, um, uh, which flows between the Morgan Stanley, which is the supplier, and CCFA. Uh, and then there's various custodial agreements. Here we specifically identify the front end custodian. Um, and again, that just stipulates some of the terms specifically with Bank of New York. Uh, CCFA is custodian for how those uh, funds flow, similar to how EBC has specific custodian agreements to us as technically different parties, different flows on different parts of the cast. I know I'm going through this very quickly, so of course, okay. happy to take there's a question. A, there's a question uh, they're raising in. Next slide. You have a question. I do. I do. I do. And the chair can cut me off if I'm too in the weeds, but um, this all sort of makes my head hurt a little bit. Uh, so the the, the Moody's, the rating, is that a rating of EBCE or Morgan Stanley or just the rating on the agreement? It's technically a rating on the agreement, the, on transaction. the transaction. On the transaction. It does okay. not actually look at our credit risk. Got it. Okay. Uh, it's on the transaction itself. And, and how as I noted earlier, it's really based off of Morgan Stanley's credit rating. Because okay. okay. they're the ones who hold the funds. And if something were to go wrong, yeah. you know, bondholders are based off of their credit itself. Got it. Okay. Um, and then do, do, does EBCE have any kind of bonding capacity that we need to be cognizant of in terms of issuing this kind of 
We don't, because again, these are fully off balance sheet, non recourse okay. debt transactions. And then, we are rated by mm -hmm. S and P, and we've talked to them, and they've you know they've blessed and said, yeah, this doesn't change your rating at all. This is not debt that you're taking on. So, okay. and then finally, um, I'm just this is more of a curious, and this is where you can cut me off if you'd like, Chair. Um, does then is part of the appeal for Morgan Stanley to then turn around and kind of bundle this into some type of ESG investment for their investors like is this because i saw the language green bond or green energy yeah. right i'm just curious if that's part of the short answer is no this okay. is this is designated as a green bond that's okay. to bond investors okay it's their benefit okay get into a discussion as to whether that really reduces the cost or not but okay I think there is some benefit in designating a green bond. Okay. Ultimately, Morgan Stanley's benefit are, are, are twofold, two big ones. They earn bond underwriting fees by being the bond underwriter for this transaction. So they, they get fees there. Yeah. And then their treasury department actually gets funds. So, and, and obviously, their treasury department can go raise liquidity capital any number yeah. of means. Lots and lots of this is just yeah. one additional okay. means that their treasury department can go raise. Um, Adrian, if you go back, there's two more slides. Um, next slide. We just kind of put this under the other. This is the preliminary offering statement. Um, that is sort of a summary of the transaction as a whole. This is what you use to market the bond. So, uh, your, your typical bond investors are really, really digging to this document. It's a pretty long document, but if, if you're going to pick one document to read, <laughs> this is sort of an overarching summary of everything. This is what the bond investors yeah. Uh, and then last one, um, this is just to show you what the specific approval is that we will be seeking at the July board meeting. So uh, specifically authorization for EBC to sign these various agreements, which are uh, you know, the slide that we covered, uh, and to specifically move forward with this brief transaction. These two parameters, one is that the notional price of the bonds uh, does not exceed a billion dollars. We feel like that's sufficient scale. and what kind of want to do bite sizes over time, mm -hmm. uh, and then a minimum discount of $4.50 per megawatt. I have bracketed of that um, just because we may want to change that up until the oh. July board meeting. We have achieved higher than that in all cases in the past, huh. um, but that's sort of what we want to make sure that we're establishing uh, right. a clear line of the board on. You know, we're not going to go execute something that's less than, right. less than this. Um, order of magnitude wise, what we're we always target is 10%. Um, I was and just going to ask if that's what yeah. percentage that is. Yeah. Yeah. So that's um, if you look at a forward curve, uh, I don't know the exact number that it is today, but the forward curve over a third year was probably sixty to seventy dollars. So it was shy of ten percent. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to create a floor that we think is achievable. Yeah. But our what we will really look to execute on mm -hmm. is is ten percent, okay. and hopefully better, of course. But <laughs> but you know we've we've kind of stretched in, in other oh. cases. To hit those, you know, those right, right, right. levels. Okay. That's the, that's the, the last presentation. Okay. There, there's a, an appendix with other some other statistics mm. and flow charts. Oh. Um, and we have shown that in, in prior cases, so that's not new at all, actually. Okay. But you know, that's just there for continued reference. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Members of the public who would like to comment on this item will have two minutes to comment. I'll first ask if we have received any written comments for this item. We have received no written comments for this item. Okay, there are no members here present. Are there any members online who would like to comment? There are no hands raised, so public comment is now closed. And I will turn to the committee for further discussion. I will ask uh, Member Bedoya, do you have any questions or comments for the staff? Um, thank you for asking the question earlier about the um, how the terms non-recourse kind of fit into this. Um, I had that same concern, um, but I'm good with that. Side. Thank you. Okay. Member Anderson, do you have any other questions or comments? Um, no, but I appreciate the chair allowing me to ask questions throughout the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, it was a very uh, meaty topic, so I figured it's better <laughs> to learn collectively as we went along. So it's not as uh, yeah. perhaps as uh, uh, obvious of a topic as other items. Okay, well, I don't have any comments. Uh, questions were answered, and I appreciate becoming uh, far more educated on how this system and structure works and it uh, appears to be in good form. So with that, we'll end item six. I'll move to item seven, which is committee member and staff announcements, including requests by members to place items on the future board agenda. I'll first start with, are there any staff members who need to make a comment or wish to make a comment? Just raise your hand. 
So you no know, staff comments. I'll ask committee members, do you have any comments? Or do you wish, Member Bedoya? Not at this time, thank you, thank you, Chair. Okay, and are there any members who wish to request a future agenda item outside of what was presented to us in the earlier item for the agendas for the coming months? Okay, seeing none, that will move us to item eight. Uh, Adrian, the time is 2.14 p.m. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Everybody have a nice day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think I need to go get a new brain to understand. <laughs>